Hi everyone, Jacinta here. Dan and I and the rest of the Cosmic Savannah team are having uh, a bit of a week off. We all have a lot of things to catch up on, a lot of projects to work on. I myself am uh, working on a TED Talk, which I will be presenting in Western Australia in a few weeks. Um, and I'm very excited about that. I will hopefully tell you more about that a bit later. But for now, here is a rerun of episode 11 from all the way back in season one. And in this episode, uh, well, we chose this episode to rerun because it's about Australia. <laughs> so it's from the last time that I visited Australia and I got to chat um, all about the SKA telescope and its precursors, Meerkat and its preceding CAT7 and also the ones in Australia, uh, ASCAP and MWA. Uh, I was in Australia for a conference on neutral hydrogen gas, which if you're a regular listener of the show, you know that's one of my most favorite topics. So here is an episode playing one of our very first episodes on neutral hydrogen gas, also known as H1. And I thought it was topical because um, you get to hear about a little bit about my life in Australia, which is where I am still <laughs> at the moment, still waiting for a visa. And you, you can hear uh, we go on a little tour of my backyard here with all the birds and the bushland and my dogs. Uh, and you get a bit of context from uh, about where I am at the moment. And in this episode, we chat with Dr. Ivy Wong, Dr. Brenda Namumba, and Professor Peter Quinn. Peter Quinn and Ivy Wong are both uh, around here at the University of Western Australia and associated institutes. Uh, they're still here at the moment, although Peter Quinn is just about to retire as the director of ICRA the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, after 13 years. So I'd like to wish Peter well in, in whatever he moves on to in the future. And I would like to thank him very much because he himself and another researcher called Lister Stavely-Smith basically changed my life and set, my, set me on this career path that I'm on now. So it's thanks to Peter that you're hearing me now on the Cosmic Savannah. So thank you very much, Peter, for everything you've done and good luck in the future. And uh, Brenda Namumba, who you'll also hear from, has gone on to do amazing things. She is a postdoctoral researcher, I believe, for the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, but she is based somewhere in Europe. I always see amazing photos from her European travels. So wherever you are, Brenda, well done on all of your successes. Yeah, and with that, I will leave you to enjoy this episode, and Dan and I will be back uh, next time with a brand new episode. Bye, everyone. Welcome to the Cosmic Savannah with Dr. Daniel Kanema and Dr. Jacinta Dalhays. Each episode, we'll be giving you a behind the scenes look at world class astronomy and astrophysics happening under African skies. Let us introduce you to the people involved, the technology we use, the exciting work we do, and the fascinating discoveries we make. Sit back and relax as we take you on a safari through the skies. Righto. Today? We're going to Australia. Oh, we're, we're going ready. on tour. We're, okay. si we're sitting in our studio. Well, <laughs> we're taking the listeners on an audio journey to Australia. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm very excited to uh, be going uh, virtually to my home country. <laughs> <laughs> well, you went physically too, right? I did, and, yeah. And, and did some recordings. You were, you were there for a conference uh, and chatted to a couple of people. Uh, Yep. Yeah, I chatted to Dr. Ivy Wong and Professor Peter Quinn from the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And I also chatted to Dr. Brenda Namumba from the University of Cape Town. And we were all there in Perth in Western Australia for a conference, as you said. And uh, Perth is actually my hometown. It's where I grew up and did all my studies. Uh, actually, my hometown is about an hour south of Perth in a town called Mandurah. So I got to go back and do a bit of work and also have a bit of a holiday. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I visited ICRA a few times, as you know, during my PhD. I was working with some people there and uh, was fortunate enough to spend four to six weeks uh, a year during my PhD there. It was really, really nice. Um, I enjoyed it. It's a similar climate to Cape Town, completely different bird life. 
<laughs> as you'll hear later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the conference was at the University of Western Australia, um, which is one of the two joint partners in ICRA, the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, the other partner being Curtin University. So I did all of my studies at UWA, University of Western Australia, and uh, my PhD at ICRA. And yeah, I guess that's well. We we met in South Africa first, but mm. then we we um, got to know each other a bit more. I think we met at one of these Ikra. Fisk conferences. Was Probably. it Probably. I think it was. Yeah. We yeah, were, it we were, was actually. We were both working on H one and. What is a Fisk conference? Oh, well, we'll get to that later. <laughs> okay. All right. You managed to take some time off while you were there too. Go home. Yeah, yeah, I got to go and uh, see my family, see my dogs, Tonka and Caddy, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, spend a bit of time in the bushland. What do you call the bushland here in South Africa? The felt. The, the felt? Felt, oh. Oh, okay. Which basically means bush. Well, the field, but, you know. Mm-hmm. So felt. is that where you have, like, trees and stuff, or is it more, like, lower Yeah, shrubs? like, the, so, I mean, the, the, there, there are various felts, like there's the, the bush felt, as I think of the bush felt, there are sort of low trees, acacias, whereas, you know, if you go a little bit higher in altitude, the, the felt becomes a lot less treed, a lot more grassland. Mm, in Australia, the bush is like has the characteristic eucalyptus trees, gum trees mm. everywhere, which is which are also here in Cape Town in South Africa, uh, everywhere. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I guess here they're a, a bit of a pest. Mm. Soaking up all of the water, and there's no koalas to keep them under control. <laughs> but of course, they're native to Australia, and so yeah, so like walking amongst the eucalypt trees is is mm. what I think of when I think of home. So I thought I would actually record a bit of that for you and and play it for our listeners. So you can hear what the Australian bushland sounds like. Awesome. Should we take a listen? Yeah. Hello from the Australian bushland. I'm here in my hometown in Western Australia. So I'm going for a walk. I'm looking at all of the beautiful gum trees around me. Maybe you can hear my dogs in the background. Come here girl. You want me to throw the ball for you? Come here. Hello. Here you go. Ready? Catch. Maybe you can hear the wind, the wind rustling the leaves, and the crickets. The birds are a bit quiet at the moment. There's one. It's a very blue sky today, very clear. Let's go for a bit of a walk. Come on, dogs. Yeah, very cool. It's like the sound of your home. It is, yeah. I feel a little homesick now. I'm sure. (laughs) But it's not too bad because actually Cape Town is probably the one um, place in the world that is the most similar to Perth. Yeah, we. I mean, we have this Mediterranean climate, Mm -hmm. winter rainfall. At a very similar latitude as well. Yeah, on the West Coast, uh, similar latitude, very similar temperatures and wind patterns, good for kart surfing. And and I mean, what with all the eucalypts we have here too, it's also it does feel very familiar. Yeah, I felt very familiar in in Perth. Mm. But it wasn't actually just all fun and games. I did actually do a bit of work. I did oh, do some astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> and you did some recording. I did some recording. Yeah, so I was there for the um, Fisk meeting, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Uh, we were talking about H one neutral hydrogen gas, which is a very important component of galaxies. And we were talking about the different surveys of the sky you can do in H1 um, with the Pathfinder telescopes. And precursor telescopes. Sorry, Pathfinder and precursor telescopes. Yeah, there's a subtle difference there that, you know, has become a, has become something which we have to clarify. Um, well, I guess we need to start all the way from the SKA to explain what the Pathfinders and precursors are, right? Sure. So, I mean, the Square Kilometre Array is this massive radio telescope which is getting built and will be completed in the next next decade. A large portion of it which will be built here in South Africa and then other parts will be built in Australia. In Western Australia? Western Australia. And in the lead up to this, various pathfinders and precursors (laughs) were built to test technology, to learn, to try things out and see what was going to work, what wasn't, and 
basically come up with the best design possible. Yeah, so these are kind of test bed telescopes, mm. which in themselves are the world's most powerful radio telescopes anyway, yeah. but they're only about 1% to 3% the size of what the full SKA will be. This is going to be an absolutely enormous endeavour. And there's Pathfinder and Precursor telescopes uh, in several different parts of the world. Of course, South Africa has Meerkat uh, and its precursor, which was Cat7. Mm. Um, which was a, It's Pathfinder. It's path. Okay. <laughs> so, definition time. Uh, the Pathfinder is essentially a, a smaller telescope or a test bed, which isn't incorporated into the larger telescope. So, Cat Seven was one of the Pathfinders we had, a small seven dish array that was not incorporated into Meerkat. Um, it's now no longer functioning, um, but we learned a lot from it and um, made a few mistakes and learned from them. Meerkat, on the other hand, is a precursor to the SKA because Meerkat will be directly incorporated into the SKA array. Okay, and, and then and I that guess that is the difference, right? And then I guess the other precursors are well, ASCAP, the Australian SKA Pathfinder in Western yeah. Australia. Is that not a Pathfinder? Mm. Because it's not incorporated into the high frequency array. That's true. I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess that's another aspect of SKA. There's two main parts. There's a higher frequency mm. part of SKA, which is going to be the telescopes look like satellite dishes. Mm. And then there's a lower frequency component. That's the part going mm. in Western Australia. Um, and that's we still don't really know what the final design of those telescopes will look like, but they one particular design is like a metal spider or a, a metal umbrella. And the metal spider kind of design, there is a precursor in Western Australia, and that's called the Murchison Wide Field Array or the MWA. Yeah. And there are other pathfinders around the world. There's Apatif in the Netherlands, there's Fast in China, uh, there's quite a few. So that was a nice little foray into some definitions. <laughs> <laughs> Which we do occasionally. <laughs> That's good. Yes, another, another definition is the name of the conference, FISC, P-H-I-S-C-C. <laughs> And what does it stand for? Okay, so I think we should just go right in ahead into our first interview with Dr. Ivy Wong. She's a researcher at ICRA, and she was the, the chair of the organising committee of FISC. So she'll give us our definition and tell us a bit more about uh, what the conference was about. Great. I'm here at the 12th FISC workshop in, uh, at the University of Western Australia. And uh, with me here is the chair of the local organising committee and scientific organising committee, Dr. Ivy Wong. Welcome, Ivy. Thank you, Jacinta. So, Ivy, you've done an enormous job getting together this uh, international conference. Can you tell us what is FISC and what, what is it all about? Okay, so FISC stands for the Pathfinder for H1 Surveys Coordination Committee. So it doesn't sound like a very good name, but really, it's just the coordination meeting between all the survey heads, heads for all the SK Pathfinder experiments. It's been really fun because within the field, we tend to know everyone. So in terms of organization of an international workshop such as this one, it's been a, a fair bit of work, but given that we do know each other, it's been a lot easier. And this meeting is all about uh, H1, which is the short name for neutral hydrogen gas. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what that is and why it's important and where we see it in space? H1 is neutral hydrogen, but it's actually also known as atomic hydrogen. So when you were in high school, you probably learned that hydrogen is the first element of the periodic table. It's the most simple element and the building blocks for most things we see around us since the Big Bang consists of a, an electron and a proton. And when that electron gets excited, we see it in the form of 21 centimeter radiation. And so we just call it H1 for short. And that's what it's all about. And the reason it's interesting is because most galaxies have H1. And this means that when there's sufficient H1, it can cool and form stars. What's really cool is also the fact that when we see H1, we get to see its kinematics, its motion. We could actually measure the total mass of the system, including the matter we cannot see. And so this is how we are able to see these galaxies in 3D through observing atomic hydrogen. And because it's also fluffy and wispy, it's also very 
uh, sensitive to interactions with its neighbors or any other physical processes that's occurring to that galaxy, it's shaping its evolution. So at the end of the day, H1 is a very useful tool for trying to probe the dominant processes which drive how galaxies form stars and evolve. Right, so it's like the it's like the building block of the galaxy, isn't it? It's the raw fuel from which stars form. So if you have a galaxy without any uh, H1 gas, it's kind of dead, isn't it? Well, it's not dead, it's just passively evolving. And so it'll wait until it gets a fresh supply of gas before it can form more stars. What does it mean to passively evolve? So what this means is that all the stars that are still there continue to age and the galaxy will look redder and redder. Okay, and then if it has some of the H1 gas, then it will tend to be bluer? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the state of the H1 gas is very important because while you can form stars out of H1, typically what it requires is for you to condense and cool that H1 just that little bit more to gain enough pressure to form a star. And galaxies don't just form single stars, they form a whole collection of stars in the same burst. So as you see, if you had fluffy H1 that's just hanging around doing nothing, it might take quite some time before you form stars. So why is it important for us to have a conference about H1 at the moment? So with the next generation of surveys, we're going to be able to see H1 to a much further distance in time and space. And so while we've had all these fantastic surveys with optical telescopes and space telescopes, what's been lacking is surveys and radio astronomy. And because H1 is such a cool element in the universe, we can only see it in the radio. And so as technology advances, we can see further and further into space and see back to a time when most of the universe was in H1. Right. And so we're in a really exciting time at the moment because there are all of these telescopes around the world, new a new generation of telescopes that have just come online and the very first results are coming through. And I guess that's why we're here, isn't it? To tell each other what's going on. Yes, we're here to compare our results and our instruments because these are Pathfinder instruments. And what happens is that ultimately when we build our ultimate telescope, which is the square kilometer array, We need the entire world's cooperation and working together towards the same goal. So this is why we start early and maintain our friendship and connections. Right. And um, I guess it's, it's important for all astronomers from all over the world to come together to do this because science is a very international thing, isn't it? Yes, exactly. This is why we have these annual coordination committee meetings, because if we didn't actually get everyone under the same sky communicating together and coordinating their efforts, this would never happen. So for example, in this particular meeting, we've got a huge contingent from South Africa, from China, representing their survey instruments, showing us their latest results, and all of us comparing notes so that we can, as one together, progress further. Yeah, well, thank you very much for all of your efforts, as I said before, in preparing this conference. Was it a lot of work? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Jacinta, for coming, and you're very welcome. Thanks very much for talking to us today, Ivy. You're very welcome. Cheers. Great. So we we heard from Avi about the organization and the definition of the conference and what it was there for. Um, How was it? Uh, yeah, it was really, really good. I really enjoyed it. These conferences happen um, once a year, and I've been to several of them, although this was my first in about five years. So it was really great to see everyone again, see the community. The H1 community is really friendly and collaborative, so I really enjoyed it. This year, there was a huge contingency of attendees from South Africa because this was the first year after Meerkat was launched, uh, That's that since it started running and producing data. So the very first Meerkat results were presented uh, at, the, at this FIS conference, and that was really exciting to see. Awesome. I want to see them. <laughs> you can they're all online now <laughs> all <right. laughs> excellent <laughs> um, yeah and so I spoke to one attendee Dr. Brenda Namumba about how she used Cat7 the uh, meerkat precursor pre pathfinder <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, and how she used that to study uh, H1 neutral hydrogen gas and in particular how she tried to find 
very small amounts of hydrogen gas in the outskirts of galaxies at the fuzzy edges. And we know it must be there, but it's really, really hard to see. So she was trying to, to see if she could find that H1. With CAT7. With CAT7 and, and some other telescopes And as then well. obviously Meerkat will be able to do even better. That's right. Yeah. So that's, I think, what she wants to go on to work with in the future. Excellent. Let's hear from Brenda. Hello, I'm sitting here on the shores of Matilda Bay in Western Australia with almost Dr. Brenda Namumba. Welcome, Brenda. Hi, Jacinta. Thank you for having me. Uh, Brenda, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and where you're from? Uh, so my name is Brenda Namumba. I'm a Zambian. Um, I came to Cape Town in 2012 to pursue my career in um, astrophysics. Brenda has just submitted her PhD thesis and it's going through examination at the moment. So that's why I say almost doctor. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on submitting. It's a big deal. Thank you very much. It must be quite relieving. Very, but waiting for the big, big event. <laughs> yeah, the acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, so Brenda, we are sitting here on the shores of, uh, as I said, Matilda Bay, which is uh, next to the University of Western Australia in Perth. Um, we're here for a conference at the moment, and uh, maybe our listeners can hear the sounds in the background of the birds and maybe a couple of cars and the wind. And can you see that swan over there, Brenda? Wow, that looks amazing. It's, yeah, uh, like... it's a black swan with a with a red bill. Did you know they're actually um, indigenous? to Western Australia. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, it's our it's our state symbol. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I've learned something new. This place is really amazing. I'm really enjoying Australia. Oh, you enjoy it? Yes, yes, yes. It's yeah. a place I would love to visit for science and touring. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we should start talking about science. So, yeah. as I said, we're here at the FISC conference, which is all about uh, neutral hydrogen gas. And, Brenda, you gave a presentation the other day um, that was about your PhD work. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, so, what was it about? Uh, so, basically, for my PhD, I've been looking at uh, dwarf galaxies, um, these small, tiny galaxies that are very nearby to us uh, in the local group. And um, my aim was to try and uh, study their structure, like their shape and their kinematics using the neutral hydrogen component, which is the most important uh, component when we are trying to study the um, evolution of galaxies. Okay, so you're looking at galaxies that are, real, are quite close by to us in the universe. You said the local group. What does the local group mean? Uh, so basically, the local group is a group of galaxies in which uh, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, resides in. So in that group, there are mostly like three galaxies that are similar to our own galaxy. And the rest of the galaxies in that group are, are very tiny, small galaxies that are called dwarf galaxies. And these galaxies are very unique in that their characteristics or their properties uh, are very different from other galaxies. So it's very important for us to try and understand how they evolve so that they can help us to understand uh, the overall, overall view of how galaxies uh, evolve and uh, in, interact with each other. All right, so we have these, uh, the, the big uh, galaxies near us, it will, obviously the Milky Way that we're in, and then there's Andromeda. There's Andromeda, yes. Okay, so there's three big ones, yes, yes. and there's uh, lots of small ones that you're talking about now. So they're these weird little shaped dwarf galaxies. Yeah. So what do they look like? Uh, so basically they come in different shapes uh, and have different properties, but I'm mostly interested in uh, what we call the dwarf irregular galaxies because these t galaxies tend to have high gas content so they are they have they are very rich in neutral hydrogen and because that's the main focus of my project is to look at neutral hydrogen so i focus on the dwarf irregular galaxies they have an irregular shape just from the from their name itself they also have a very simple structure you find other galaxies that are very complicated they have uh, bulges or spiral arms but these uh, dwarf irregular galaxies are very simple 
uh, which makes it easy for us to study the physics in these galaxies and understand more on how they they are born and how they live and until they die, all those processes. Okay, yeah. so you say they're, um, they're, it's important to study them because they might give us some clues about evolution of galaxies. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and you say that they're irregular, so they're not these nice spiral shapes like the Milky Way or Andromeda. Yes. Yeah, and you say they've got simple physics. What does that mean? What I mean is, you see, when we look at, for instance, when we want to study spiral galaxies, we have to take into account their spiral arms and also their central disk. But for dwarf irregular galaxies, they don't have those complicated structures that, such as the spiral arms. So they just have like one component. They don't have bulges. They don't, yeah, like this uh, uh, compact uh, stellar disk in the central region of these galaxies. So they are very simple. Like it's only one component that you're going to look at as compared to spiral galaxies where you have to look at three components in the same galaxy for you to try and understand something about them. Right, so the physics in the spiral arms might be different to the physics in the bulges, for example. Yes, yes, yes. And that becomes very complicated because the physics that you're going to use to study the spiral arms will be different from the physics that you're going to use to study the bulges. And you have to combine them to try and understand the whole entire galaxy. Yeah. Okay, so the irregular galaxies, they don't have these components. They just are all the same physics, presumably, in the entire yes, galaxy. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, and you, you were saying that you look at the neutral hydrogen gas yes. inside that. What exactly are you looking for? So basically, when you are observing, when, you, when a radio telescope is pointing at a galaxy, we observe neutral hydrogen either in emission or in absorption. Uh, but for my PhD... My focus was looking at the neutral hydrogen emission in these galaxies. So, Brenda, you are looking at the hydrogen gas in these galaxies. Your particular observations that you've done them with some radio telescopes is trying to pick up um, really faint levels of hydrogen gas that we haven't been able to detect before. Why is it important to detect this faint gas? Yeah, so basically it's very important for us to be able to detect the faint gas around galaxies because we're able to find the total H1 mass and also the total size of the galaxies. Like we can be able to determine their total extent from neutral hydrogen because neutral hydrogen, as we know, is the most extended extended observable component as compared to other elements that we, we observe at other wavelengths. Right, so I guess we, we want to know two fundamental properties of the galaxy, how heavy it is, essentially, yeah. its its total mass, and how big it is. Yeah. And uh, we can't figure out how big it is by looking in the, at the stars or anything, because we think that the hydrogen gas extends much further out than the diameter of the stars, isn't that right? That's very correct, yeah. So is there anything else special about the hydrogen gas at the edge of the galaxy? So the neutral hydrogen at the outskirts of galaxies is less bound by gravity and therefore tends to be easily disturbed and from this we can learn about different properties such as uh, how galaxies if galaxies are interacting with each other or if they are in isolated environments so these two parameters can easily be detected at neutral hydrogen wavelength as compared to other other wavelength Right, so if two galaxies are coming close to each other and then they interact gravitationally, that might affect the gas in the outskirts of the galaxy more than it would affect the other components like the stars or something. Yes, yes, yes. And you can easily see it by by when you observe a galaxy at a neutral hydrogen wavelength. Is this an important thing to know uh, when we're studying galaxy evolution? Yeah, it's very important because the way a galaxy is going to to behave when it's not interacting will be very different with the with the way it's going to behave when it's interacting. Yeah, because when it interacts, for instance, there is gas that is being stripped off the outer outskirts of this galaxy, and uh, the behavior changes uh, as compared to a galaxy that is only isolated. It's not interacting. You know, it's very in a quiescent state, and the way the gas moves is quite different. So you actually learn a, a lot by studying the environments in which galaxies reside in when it comes to galaxy evolution. 
So I guess it's um, it's pretty hard to see this faint gas even in close by galaxies, isn't it? Yeah, it's very different when we look at uh, the current telescopes that uh, we have. Although, let me not say currently because at the moment we have telescopes that are able to actually detect the H1 in the outskirts of galaxies. So you're talking about Meerkat? Yeah, so currently we have Meerkat, but for my PhD project, I actually used the CAT-7, which uh, was initially built as uh, an engineering testbed for Meerkat. But when we look at the properties of uh, CAT-7, this uh, instrument had compact baselines. So basically, when I talk about compact baseline, the telescopes are built very close to each other, and... uh, that enables uh, the telescope to see extended structures as compared to telescopes that are built very far from each other. So CAT7 had antenna that were close together and that means because of some complicated processes in in radio astronomy that you can detect what we call diffuse emission, so the faint fuzzy emission that spread out over larger areas. Is that correct? Yeah, that's very correct, yeah. So you used CAT7. That's that's pretty exciting. Yeah, the, it was very exciting to work with CAT7 because I was one of the students who started working with the telescope when it uh, it was first built because I started working with uh, CAT7 just from my master's and I continued with my PhD. So it's it's actually one of the telescopes that is very close to my heart now. <laughs> yeah, well, you're actually going to, now that you've uh, finished your PhD, you're about to start your first job as an astronomer as a postdoctoral researcher with Sareo, the South African Radio Astronomical Observatory. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on that position, first <laughs> thank of you, all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And much. what will you be working on? Uh, so basically, I plan to continue working on dwarf galaxies as my main project. However, with my postdoc, I will be using the Meerkat, which has a very high sensitivity and very high resolution as compared to the CAT-7. So from this, we hope to actually be able to obtain even better results uh, than we had for my PhD. And with uh, this, I hope to also combine my radio observations with multi-wavelength data that will allow me to study different processes that occur in galaxies. So I plan to use like optical to study the ongoing star formation in galaxies, combine it with radio observations so that uh, we can actually go in details to study how galaxies uh, form and evolve. Yeah, so a lot of the time, a lot of the power in what we can do in astronomy comes from not just looking at one type of light, so just radio, but actually combining it with other types like optical, which is released by stars, and then you've got the radio from the gas and the infrared from the dust, and then it's just by combining all of these data that you can get a clearer picture of what's going on in the galaxy. Yes, that's very correct because uh, we get different different wavelengths give us different information and when we combine different wavelengths we actually have a very clear picture on what we really want as a compare which is different when we only look at uh, one wavelength yeah so it is very important for us to actually be able to combine different wavelengths if we want to have a full picture on how galaxies form and evolve and I, that's the key thing that we want to understand as astronomers Fantastic. <laughs> well, good luck with all of that. Work. <laughs> Thank you. We're gonna we're getting attacked by birds here. There's a crow behind you <laughs> oh. making those terrible sounds, and there's a duck here <laughs> in front of us. Yeah. We are surrounded by nature. <laughs> yeah. So I guess uh, that might be time to wrap up the this discussion. Thank you very much for talking to us today, Rhonda. Okay. Thanks very much, Jacinta. So I'm pleased to report that uh, Brenda has now finished uh, her PhD, has graduated from that. So she's full Dr. Brenda Namumba. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and some of the listeners might remember that we actually gave a shout out to her and some other graduates in our previous episode. Yeah. Oh, and um, a small correction. <laughs> the black swan is is not native just to Western Australia, but is native to all of Australia. It's just quite prolific and present in Western Australia. There used to be one where I grew up. Really? 
in Peter Maritzburg. That's what? I know, it was super weird. It was wild. Oh. Um, and it lived on one of the little lakes at a shopping center. My gosh, how did it get there? Nobody knows. Wow. I mean, maybe it got stuck in a hurricane or something. Or maybe it was just, I don't know, somebody's pet or something that mm. got, got away. Wow. <laughs> it was always quite cool. It lived with the, it lived with the white swans. So. Okay, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. They kind of fit it in. Well, it's not just black swans that connect Australia and South Africa. As we mentioned, the SKA is going to be built both in South Africa and Western Australia. And the government and the people of both of these countries are very dedicated to the project. Yeah, it's been an incredible collaborative effort, as you say, uh, both Australia and South Africa, but then many other countries to the, as we've mentioned before, the head office for the, the SKA organisation is in Manchester in the UK. Uh, and the declaration or the treaty, uh, the SKA treaty is busy traveling around the world at the moment and getting signatures from all of the governments of the related parties. Uh, I think South Africa just signed it in December. So the, the treaty is busy getting signed by all of these countries. It's a it's an incredible international project and a, a kind of an amazing international collaboration. Yeah. And I guess it's only through international collaboration that it will be possible for something this big and this epic to get mm. built. Yeah, no, for sure. It's very exciting. Yeah. So I spoke to Professor Peter Quinn, who's the director of ICRA, and he chatted about how important these collaborations are and what kind of science they'll be doing. Great. Let's hear from Peter. I'm here at the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research in Western Australia, and with me today is Professor Peter Quinn. Hello, Peter. Hi, how are you? Peter, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure. So, Peter Quinn, I'm an Australian by birth, but like most astronomers, spent most of my life around the world doing research in America and North America and South America and uh, Europe. Um, so, it's a very international career for all astronomers, and I've done that. I'm primarily a computational astrophysicist, I guess, by training, like galaxy dynamics, like computers, like galaxy formation and dark matter. But over the course of time, became very interested in data and data-intensive astronomy and how you acquire data and move it and use it to do astronomy with it. So I've been involved with that as well. And uh, that career has brought me back here to West Australia to be part of the SKA. Great. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role that you're currently in? So I came back to Western Australia in 2006 uh, because Western Australia was at that time being considered as one of the places for the SKA. And the Western Australian government, the Australian government were very keen to start developing capacity, uh, places, uh, institutes, people, skills in Australia because of that SKA opportunity. So I came back in 2006 and my job was to basically start a new research centre here in Western Australia to create a landing pad, uh, sort of a critical mass of, of young people to a, obviously use eventually the SKA, but most importantly to sort of think about how to build it and how to design it and how to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. So we put together this thing called the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research here in Perth. It's a joint venture of Curtin University and University of Western Australia. We have money from those universities, from the state government and from the federal government. Currently, we're about 120 staff and about 80 graduate students and uh, we're growing very strongly. We're doing very well as a research organization, uh, ranked pretty highly in the world. And um, I guess over the course of one of the things I like to admire about ICRA the most is over the course of that 10 years, basically, uh, we went from no astronomers on the West Coast to now about one third of all the astronomers in Australia live on the West Coast. So it's a, a shift in the demographic from the East Coast to somewhere in the middle of Nullarbor, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's a big change. Yeah, I actually did my PhD here at, at ICRO with, with you and a few other researchers here. And it's grown really quickly, hasn't it? It has. It's 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 amazing to see the growth, as I said, from basically a handful of people and literally a handful of people uh, to now over 120 staff and 80 plus graduate students. And we're comparable to about the fifth largest institute of the I mean, radio astronomy institute in the world. And uh, that's all happened because of the excitement, I guess, of the SKA. We've, you know, people want to be involved in something this large and this important, but also the the funding that's come from the universities, from the Australian government, federal government. They're all keen to support science, to support the the growth of this as a remarkable piece of science that can be done in Australia. But also, they love what might come with the science. So the technology and the advances and the innovation, all the things that all the problems we have to solve to make the SKA work. They're things that are interesting, obviously, for astronomers, but also for other companies and industries and people around the world. 
Yeah, when I started my PhD here, I think I was one of the only students. I had an entire floor of a building to myself, and now we're all crammed in fighting for space. (laughs) There's so many of us. Can you tell us a little bit more about how ICRA and the SKA are tied to South Africa and South Africa's role in, in the SKA? So SKA, um, of course, is a, a multi-wavelength telescope in some sense. It has low frequency and it has high frequency. And we're lucky to have two sites in the world which uh, present probably the best opportunities to do that. So the South African site and the Australian site together cover that wavelength range very, very well. Different technologies and different approaches, but the, a broad wavelength range. So it's the sites, the quality of the two sites is is obviously fantastic. And you know, the isolation and, and the commitment of both governments – to protect those sites, to make sure that they are great sites forever. Uh, again, you can pr- both gov- both governments should be you know, proud of that and, you know, heritage, if you like, world heritage kind of approach to doing science. So, um, so indeed, yeah. So the the two governments and the two projects are and the two sites are very very important. Clearly, uh, internationally, of course, we're all astronomers, and astronomers need to work together to be able to study the universe. We all see the same sky, uh, it all goes by our heads, but we don't all see it at the same time. So we have to work together to be able to map parts of the sky and combine those maps together to to solve science problems. And so that's why there are meetings like the meetings here uh, at the moment, where astronomers from various parts of the world get together and and able to combine their ideas because they can't all do it individually, they have to do it collectively because there's a big sky out there and it's all one big sky. So that's an important um, uh, element of, of the SKA that both Australia and South Africa obviously need to share in. And I think both Australia and South Africa see um, the SKA as an opportunity to grow in various ways. So our South Africa to grow a community of scientists, a community of young people wanting to do science. Australia because it sees – uh, it has a heritage in astronomy, but it also sees opportunities for itself in the future in astronomy and also wants uh, it to be a good global partner in research. And that's what I think South Africa wants as well, that, that these days the kinds of projects that science are doing are so big that if you don't have global collaboration, you won't do them, right? The SKA is a billion euros worth of telescope. No one country has enough money to do that. So you have to combine your resources to be able to do that. And that's what global science is not just about astronomy. It's about all sorts of global science and global technology. It, they won't happen unless you get lots of people to work together. And so working together is an important skill. Yeah, I guess it's, um, I'd say it's one of the the big bonuses of astronomy is that we're all under one sky. And yep. so we can all work together yep. uh, on huge projects like this. And it is only through the working together that we can facilitate such enormous uh, endeavors, isn't it? Absolutely. It's it's said it's it's not possible for one person to see the whole sky uh, at any one time. So it's it's very important. We have to work together. I think the other thing is to said a project of the scale of SKA. Y- y- the money is is huge, but also the task is huge. So if you look at the SKA to build it, we have to design probably ten or twenty or thirty different things. There are different skills all over the world, so um, and we have to bring those skills together to solve th- those problems. No one country has all the skills you need to to build a telescope like this. And so South Africa, through its engagement in CAT and Meerkat, through uh, its radio astronomy heritage, Australia through its radio astronomy heritage, bring different skills, but 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 complementary skills to the SKA problem. Can you tell us a little bit more about the two different aspects of the SKA, the mid-frequency and the low-frequency, and um, what kind of antennas are going to be on each site? So, as I said before, it's a multi-wavelength telescope. It has to solve different – it wants to solve different science problems. Some of the science problems have information arriving at Earth in the low-frequency part of the spectrum, so the same sort of frequency as FM radio stations. So in Australia, our site is a good site for that FM sort of band signal, about 100 megahertz or so. Um, And so we are building the low-frequency telescope for this guy in Australia that operates around about that 100 megahertz. It doesn't have dishes. It doesn't look like a radio telescope that people might think about. It doesn't have a big – you know, as I said, satellite dish kind of structure. It has little tiny antennae that sit on the ground and they don't move. They sit there and they look at the whole sky all the time. And, and they it, kind of look like metal spiders, They look like they? little spiders or Christmas trees <laughs> or whatever, but they. But you need vast amounts of computer power to plug on the back of those metal, simple metal objects to be able to make them act like a telescope, to be able to make them act, you know, look at a particular part of the sky and collect data from it. So it's a very digital telescope in that respect as well. 
In the case of South Africa, they've got the mid-frequency problem, which they are optimally suited for in terms of their site. So that's about 10 times higher frequency than the low frequency. It's about 1,000 megahertz or gigahertz. And that's where dishes are really important. That's where dishes are optimal for receiving those sort of signals, the sort of dishes, as I said, we see on house roofs and things like that, but much bigger, of course. So these are dishes which point at a particular part of the sky and receive the signal from that part of the sky and look and combine that data together to form a map. So it's more of an analog telescope in the sense that they, the dishes do a lot of the work, whereas in the SKLO, the computers do a lot of the work, but both are necessary to solve the problem. As I said, collecting the data, once you collect the data, whether it's through a digital telescope or an analog telescope, you've got a vast amount of data to, to solve. And so both the South African telescope and the Australian telescope, as part of the SKA, produce enormous amounts of data. And that data challenge is common on for the whole SKA family. Can you tell us a little bit more about the different kinds of science you can do with each of these two antennas and whether you can do the same science on both as well? So the SKA low in Australia is optimised for that low frequency signal, about, a, about 100 megahertz or so. It turns out that that's the frequency band at which the signal from the very distant universe arrives at the Earth. So the, we believe when the universe was first made, first formed, uh, there was a lot of hot hydrogen gas floating around the place. It was most of the universe was made of it. Uh, and that gas, when it cools down, gives off a radio signal. And that radio signal reaches the Earth at about the frequency of 100 megahertz or so. So the 100 megahertz sky is kind of a picture of that very early, early, early first 100,000 years or so of the universe. So if we want to study that period in the universe, low frequency is the place to go. If you come a bit closer to us and now galaxies and stars are formed and galaxies grow black holes and black holes spit out vast amounts of energy and change galaxies, um, that sort of frequency is about 10 times higher. It's a gigahertz or a few gigahertz. And that's when you need the dishes of meerkat. So dishes of meerkat are fantastic for looking at the gas and the high energetic particles that are inside galaxies. So those are things, all the, all the energetic processes that are going on that shape and form and change galaxies uh, are must study. The black holes are studied with meerkat. Spinning stars, pulsars, neutron stars, giving out bursts of radiation, they're studied with meerkat. And also just the hydrogen gas after it cools off and collects around galaxies is also studied by meerkat. So most of the things in the universe, you know, in local to us in the universe that we see with our telescopes, optical telescopes, meerkat's going to give us radio insights into. Meerkat and also the SKA. Meerkat and eventually, of course, meerkat and and um, are the it's it's evolution into the mid frequency part of the SKA. So SKA mid, which is a you know the the growth of meerkat, if you want to call it that, but and SKA low, which is again you know something that's going to grow from some of the small telescopes we have on SKA site here in Australia, but also be a new telescope as well. And is there any particular benefit of having different aspects of the telescope in different parts of the world to see the sky at different times? So there's a couple of benefits. One is, of course, if you're if you're mapping a particular part of the sky, a particular chunk of the sky, that, that part of the sky moves over Australia, then moves over South Africa. So if you're exposing on both sides, you get twice as much information. So you've got you know twice two opportunities to look at it, which is fantastic. Also, some things are time variable. So ex, say ex, some star explodes, it might be seen in Australia, but by the time we, we want to follow its evolution and it sets in the West and it's then picked up by our friends in South Africa. So so things that change on the sky, we've got a chance, two chances to see it and map it and evolve it. Also combining the data directly, if you want to combine data from telescopes in South Africa and telescopes in Australia at the same time, you can actually make pictures of the sky which are much higher resolution than pictures you can just make from either one side. So lots of opportunities for working together. So this um, second aspect that you talked about, is this what we call VLBI, Very Long Baseline so Interferometry? That's, yeah, that's what's called VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry. It means that basically each one of these telescopes, both the SKA Low and the SKA Mid, are interferometers. They have lots and lots of dishes or antennae. You combine the signal together and you produce a map of the sky, which has got a resolution which is high because you've put them all those signals together in a special way called interferometry. Um, you can do the same thing even if the two dishes are, are continents apart, right? And so the further out they are apart, uh, the better the picture you can make. It just becomes harder, of course. The further they are apart, you have to be very careful about combining them in that special way to produce the high resolution. But, but interferometry is possible across the whole Earth. So in preparation for the SKA, there's been several what we call Pathfinder telescopes being built around mm. the world, hasn't there? So uh, the, one of them in South Africa is, of course, Meerkat. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a, a little bit more about the Australian ones? 
So in Australia, we've been lucky to have two Pathfinder projects, um, so-called precursors. They are the Murchison Widefield Array, which is a, a low-frequency telescope. So it has these little spider kind of fixed things that run around. There's about two or 3,000 of those uh, distributed around on the desert. Um, and they that's a low-frequency telescope, and it's very similar physics and very similar science and very similar science questions that it's addressing that the SKA low will address. It's only about, you know, sort of 1% the size of the SKA low, but it's still a fantastic little telescope on its own right. It's producing amazing pictures of the sky in the low frequency part of the spectrum. So it's an operational telescope. It's a training ground for students. It's a great science tool, but it's also a great precursor and teaching tool for learning how to build the SKA. Meerkat, of course, is a uh, higher frequency. It's the mid frequency, about 10 times higher in frequency. It's going to go, that telescope, Meerkat, will dr- gr- directly grow into the SKA and meld into the SKA mid telescope. And again, the technologies, the dishes, the, the science we're doing with Meerkat is again very much a, a small scale example, a small car scale starting point for the SKA science. So, yeah, both are very directly relevant to the science. Both are rel- directly relevant to the technology problems that they're going to be addressed by SKA, mid and SKA low. And they're a teaching tool. They teach us how to, how to solve those problems, hopefully in the future. Yeah, and these telescopes are only about 1% to 3% the size of the SKA, yeah. yet they're still the world's most powerful radio telescopes at the moment. So imagine what the SKA will do. It makes you uh, put it into perspective, yes? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> What do you envisage as the um, future of collaboration between Australia and South Africa as we move forward towards SKA Phase 1? I think it's on several fronts. Um, Obviously, we're all part of the big SKA project, and and because of that, um, we share a common... rewards of the project in terms of you know access to the great telescope we and we opportunities to do science together uh, scientific projects together uh, opportunities to train students together and have students work um, on at both sites from Africa coming to Australia and Australia going to Africa postdoctoral people like your good self uh, going from one country to another again this is an exchange of people and ideas between the two countries to solve scientific problems I think that's fantastic Australia and South Africa are collaborating and obviously building and designing the SKA, and so we have technology spin-offs and technology opportunities that come to both countries as part of the SKA family as well. Um, so, this, you know, this, both scientifically and technically, we have these opportunities that go together. But I think it also teaches both countries about, as I said, doing global science. I mean, both Australia and South Africa are not big countries in the, in, in the world stage. They're in the Southern Hemisphere, all the, all the actions in the North in some sense. So in, in the Southern Hemisphere, we have to be good collaborators. We have to learn how to collaborate all over the world. Uh, it's not like we're in the middle of Europe where it's somewhat easier. Um, so in learning to be part of big projects and learning to be good collaborators is important to Australia, to Australia and to South Africa, both to the people and the scientists and also the governments. Yeah, I guess I've had the pleasure of living and working in both of these places, which Mm -hmm. were traditionally kind of underdogs in the world of astronomy and radio astronomy and are suddenly international hubs in this field. And it's uh, pretty extraordinary. No, it's it's transformational, and it is it is in in all the right kind of ways. It's transformational, and it's it brings things to South Africa in terms of its ability to offer you know new and different kinds of careers for its people, for education, for the young people, for scholarship, for training, uh, diversification of the economy. Uh, getting into areas where they haven't really been before in terms of, I said, big astronomy was not something that South Africa was ever involved with, nor was Australia for that matter. But but they're both uh, countries are, are, le- are finding opportunities to grow and develop through the SKA project, both politically, economically, socially, academically. And that's what, the, that's what these projects are all about. They're not in the end of the day, perhaps just about building something, but learning from building something. Yeah, and you mentioned that there's often a lot of um, spin-offs and uh, benefits to society as a large whenever we build one of these large sort of scientific machines. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, this, so the, telescopes are funny. I mean, you can have all these sort of all the deep thought and, and good intention about why you build them and you want to build it to solve this problem and solve that problem. But in the end of the day, telescopes tend to be uh, famous for things they weren't built for. They discover things that they didn't think they were going to find, and it's those new discoveries which are the really exciting ones. So I think I think um, we expect to see lots of interesting scientific discoveries from these telescopes, which weren't really something, you know, there'll be things which we hadn't even dreamed of, perhaps. I think also solving some of the problems we have to solve for SKA will be beneficial in many ways. We know uh, already of many examples where science has produced things which are revolutionary in terms of for society. Um, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, you know, the big atom smasher in, in, in Geneva, uh, the scientists who built that needed to build something to move data around, and they invented the web, and so the web has changed 
our lives. The Wi-Fi, which was a direct consequence of radio astronomy research here in Australia, is something that's changed our lives. Yeah, we use every day. Every single day. So these are the sort of things that, and those things were invented not because people thought they were a great idea, but because they were fulfilling a need, and that need came from a scientific need. So SKA has lots of needs, particularly around big data. I mean, you know, how do we how do we make it cheap and easy and possible to to shift exabytes of data around the planet? You know, that could have implications for all sorts of things: remote medicine, you know, all sorts of communications problems that the SKA will solve because it wants to do astronomy, but other people can use the same ideas. Well, it's been wonderful to um, have an opportunity to come back and visit, um, and uh, hopefully you'll come and visit us again soon. Have you ever been to South Africa? I have been once or twice and enjoyed it enormously and looking forward to coming back. Good. We'll be happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks very much for speaking to us today, Peter. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, great to hear from Peter and the incredible work that's been done. We, I mean, we're very proud of what has been achieved in South Africa in the last 20 years, and in particular uh, in the last 10 years with the SKA coming along, Meerkat getting built. There's been an incredible growth in the number of students and postdocs and, uh, and then also technical expertise. But in Australia, it's been the same. Uh, you know, ECRA has come up out of nowhere to be a world-leading radio astronomy research institute, and it's quite an achievement. Yeah, and as I as I said in the in the interview, it's really been such a privilege to be involved in both Western Australia and South Africa's growth from the beginning. And really, it's incredible to see just in in my short career so far the differences in both places and and how far they've come in building radio astronomy communities. Yeah, and I think it's it's going to only uh, get bigger from here. Exactly. Uh, I think it will accelerate even mm, more. Yeah, it's very exciting. Very exciting times. <laughs> uh, and the next episode is going to be part two of our tour of Australia. We're going to be hearing from a Sudanese researcher who's currently doing his PhD at ICRA. And we'll also get an update from a representative from SKA headquarters about the uh, latest status of the SKA. Oh, mm. exciting. <laughs> But that's it for today. You'll have to wait till next time. Um, thanks very much for listening, and we hope you'll join us again for the next episode of The Cosmic Savannah. As always, you can visit our website, thecosmicsavannah.com, where we'll have links related to today's episode. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where we'll post extra pictures, videos, and behind-the-scenes footage. We're at Cosmic Savannah. That's Savannah spelled S-A-V-A-N-N-A-H. Special thanks today to Dr. Ivy Wong, Dr. Brendan Namumba and Professor Peter Quinn for speaking with us. Thanks to Mark Allnut for the music production, Yanis Brink for the astrophotography, Lana Sarai for graphic design, Mihal Wojcik for photography and assistance, Sebastian Tulinski Obroshki for help in post production, and Tabisa Fikilepi for help with the social media. We gratefully acknowledge support from the South African National Research Foundation and the South African Astronomical Observatory to help keep the podcast running. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll speak to you next time on the Cosmic Savannah. Wow. <laughs> it was quite cool. It lived with the it lived with the white swans. So. Okay. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. They kind of fit it in. I mean, there's an ostrich too, <laughs> like living in, in like a game park in Marisburg. And it lives with the impala because it doesn't no, it's not an impala because it's never seen another ostrich. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna change the topic. <laughs> we should cut all of that. We out. will cut all of that. <laughs>